Lone Wolf, America Falls Occupied Territory, written by Scott Medbury, narrated by Adam Barr. This is a work of fiction. All characters and events depicted in this work are fictitious. Any resemblance to real persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Prologue Jimmy Ortega and Hector Garcia arrived at the fire station a little after midnight. They crouched in the shadows of Fresno's baseball stadium and signaled to the three men at the end of the block to come forward. Men was perhaps a stretch. They were all kids. Jimmy was in fact the oldest at sixteen and was also the freshly crowned leader of their gang, the Sereños. It was by default, really. Jimmy's older brother Yago had been the leader. He and all the older gang members were dead of the flu now, along with everyone else in the city older than sixteen or seventeen. The gang used to be forty strong and controlled the whole downtown Fresno area. Now there were only six of them left. They'd had the run of the streets since Christmas, and tonight was the first they'd heard of the Chinese invaders being in the city. They'd watched the news in the clubhouse right up until the power went out. When they weren't watching the news or caring for the dying, they were burying the dead in the turf of Chukchansi Park. It had been a couple of weeks since Yago, stubborn to the last, died, but not before anointing Jimmy his successor. And when they come here, make those fuckers pay. They had been watching for the Chinese occupying forces ever since, expecting a rolling march through the city, not one vehicle. The others joined Jimmy and Hector, and they huddled together. Okay, we're going in. Selma said the Chinese Hummer is between the two fire department SUVs. She saw four of them in there and thinks they're sleeping. Are we going to blow them away, Jimmy? asked Hector. Jimmy shook his head. He was unsure why one Chinese vehicle would come into Fresno without any backup, so he wanted to find out more. We surround them and see if we can get some answers first, here. We need to know if there are more coming. We'll blow them away once we have what we want. The others nodded. All of them looked scared. Jimmy was scared, but no way in hell was he going to show it. He fist-bumped them one by one. Let's go. The others followed him across the street and to the gate of the parking lot where they stopped as Jimmy surveyed the vehicles. He pointed at the SUV with the fire chief sign on it. It's behind that one. You two go that way with Hector, and you come with me, Donnie, he said to the scrawniest kid, Donnie. With their guns drawn, Hector led his two guys, Santiago and Seb, towards the front of the vehicles. Jimmy nodded encouragingly at Donnie and drew his gun. Donnie pulled his out of his pocket and cocked it, smiling at Jimmy. They headed off, Jimmy in front crouched low as he ran towards the target vehicles. At the rear corner of the chief's Toyota SUV, he paused and looked at the army vehicle. It was painted in camo and had some Chinese writing on it. He looked over his shoulder at the wide-eyed Donnie and with his hands indicated he should stay put. Jimmy got up. He would sneak along the Hummer until he got to the rear door. Then when Hector was in place on the other side, they would spring the doors and take the prisoners out at gunpoint. He'd barely finished his second step when the rear door opened and a tall Chinese soldier, with his back to Jimmy, stepped out and put his arms into the air, taking a long stretch. Jimmy, with his heart trying to punch its way out of his chest, knew he had to move now before the man turned and saw him. He ran forward, an alley cat stalking a rat, and put his gun hard against the back of the soldier's head. The big man froze, with his hands still in the air. Oh, you in trouble now, boy, Jimmy whispered, smiling at his own cleverness. A flash of bright light and the cacophony of automatic gunfire from the driver's window at the front of the vehicle wiped it away in an instant. 1. Sometimes, if you wait long enough, the universe delivers, even at the most unexpected times, like the end of the fucking world, for instance. Larry Dawson took a long draft of his beer and looked at his dead wife. 
She'd stopped breathing ten minutes before. He didn't need to check her pulse to know for sure. Frankly, he was surprised she'd lasted as long as she had. Never what you would call a fit woman, Sheila had come down with the Pyongyang flu on Christmas Eve. She'd lasted three whole days. Larry had nursed her, as any dutiful husband would, while he waited, hour by hour, for his own symptoms to appear. They never did. Not even a runny nose. Not even as he watched the channels with their stories of the pandemic go off the air one by one, their hosts with the same rattling breathing and snotty faces as his wife. He wasn't willing to believe he was in the clear yet, but given that Sheila had been coughing and spluttering her germs all over the place for three whole days and he was still healthy, maybe it was time to start making some plans. Larry bared his teeth in a smile that would have chilled anyone who had been there to witness it. He walked across to the front window, carefully pulled aside the curtain, and peered across the road at the Monahan's place. The normally well-manicured lawn was looking dry and was dusted with leaves, but his focus, as it had been since the Monahans had moved in the summer before, was on the front window of the second story. That was Katie's room. Before the pandemic, he'd spent a lot of his evenings at the darkened window of his upstairs study, just waiting for a glimpse of the beautiful cheerleader, when he wasn't stalking her on Instagram, that is. As he strained to see any sign of movement in her window, he thought back wistfully to the images he'd screen-captured from her Instagram and saved in an encrypted file on his desktop computer over the last few months. They were gone now. The Internet had gone down two days before, and the power had followed it yesterday. Now his only window into her life was, well, her window. For now, anyway. That would soon change. He had a plan, and as soon as her kid brother was out of the way, it was all systems go. They were probably still busy mourning the death of their parents. He'd gone over the morning before and asked if they needed anything. It had been Jack who answered the door. His eyes were red-rimmed, and Larry had heard Katie wailing in the background. The athletic teenager had been polite, but he'd held the door shut most of the way, preventing Larry from seeing in. He confirmed the obvious about his parents and thanked Larry for coming over, saying that they were okay for now. The kid was too together for a 15-year-old who had just lost his parents and now faced the end of the world, and if he wondered how Larry had dodged the Pyongyang flu bullet, he didn't voice it. Larry felt his dislike grow. Okay, son, but if you need anything, you just holler. Uh, sure, the kid said before closing the door. You'll keep, Larry had thought as he returned to his side of the street. At the window, satisfied that he wasn't going to miss anything in the next little while, he let the curtain drop and turned back to look at his dead wife. A 99.5% fatality rate for adults over the age of 17. That's what they'd said. God only knew why he hadn't bought the farm. He shrugged, then crushed his beer can with his beefy hand before throwing it into the corner of the living room. He felt a thrill of rebellion at the gesture. Sheila, who he'd let keep him under the thumb for the sake of peace, would have ripped him a new one at such a blatant disregard for her home. Most relaxed I've seen you in ages, he said, patting her still warm cheek. Come on, old girl, time for a long rest. He grabbed the back of her easy chair and started to wheel her out of the living room. He was a barrel-chested forty-year-old, strong without being overly muscled, but it was no easy task. Sheila, who was ten years his senior, weighed in at around two hundred and thirty pounds, and the stressed casters didn't like the shag pile one bit. By the time he eventually got her onto the linoleum floor of the kitchen, he had a light sheen of perspiration on his high forehead. He paused at the door to the basement. His initial thought was to store her down there, but that's where he would keep Katie. It wouldn't do to have Sheila stinking up the place. That wouldn't be romantic at all. Sorry, my dear, it's into the shed you go. Twenty minutes later, with Sheila ensconced in a wheelbarrow with a tarp over her, 
he wheeled the easy chair back into the kitchen and out to the living room. On his way back through the kitchen, he ignored the faint rotting smell from the fridge as he grabbed another can of Coors before heading down to the basement to finish his preparations. He had started the work yesterday when it was clear Sheila wouldn't be moving from her chair again. In the afternoon, he had cleared the floor of the basement, making room for his workspace. That evening, after he had fed his wife her last supper, lukewarm chicken broth, he had gone back down and spent four hours constructing two small walls from cinder blocks. The walls were set facing each other six feet apart. Each was two blocks wide and four high. Larry's breath plumed in the cold basement as he checked to see if the mortar was dry and satisfy himself that the two mini walls were sturdy. He then headed to the back corner and retrieved the solid timber door that was leaning against the wall. A few minutes later, he had laid it out and secured the door on top of his mini walls like a tabletop. He tested it by climbing on it and laying lengthwise, then rolling this way and that. The bed didn't creak or rock. Satisfied, he climbed off and went to his workbench. He picked out three items and set them to the side before fastidiously rearranging the remaining tools so that they lined up neatly. When he was finished, he picked up one of the items he'd set to the side. It was a large, freshly sharpened carving knife. He held it up in front of his eyes and pressed the pad of his index finger to the blade. He smiled and tucked it under his arm, then picked up the length of rope and a roll of masking tape and headed for the stairs. He hummed Enter the Sandman, his favorite Metallica tune, as he went. Phase two of Operation Katie would begin the next day. The dirt-covered figure stood in the kitchen, staring across the living room and out into the backyard as the afternoon light faded. Jack Monahan sipped warm Gatorade. The only clean skin on his face was in the tracks left by his earlier tears. He had finally broken when the first shovelful of dirt fell on his mother's shrouded body. His parents had been dead when he had woken up the previous morning. For him... That whole day was lost, washed away by waves of emotion, anger, sadness, rage. This morning had been different. He hadn't cried, not even as he'd wrapped them in bed sheets and carried them one at a time down into the backyard. He had spent the day carefully marking out the graves and digging them deep enough to be sure they wouldn't be disturbed by animals before carefully laying them in their final resting place. He had thought he was cried out, but the finality of the dirt falling on the woman who had borne him had broken him again. Looking out at the graves, anger chased exhaustion from his face and he threw the bottle across the room at the big window. The liquid exploded from the open lid and painted the glass in a vivid orange bloom, slowly melting its way to the bottom of the pane like the tears of a dragon. The grief and physical exhaustion of digging two graves caused his broad shoulders to slump as he leaned over the counter. Jack was tall and well-built for a sixteen-year-old. A natural athlete, his grandma used to say, before she'd passed away. He was quarterback on his school football team, and there were already murmurs of a scholarship. He was also the captain of the school trap shooting team, something his mom wasn't super cool with, but tolerated, as long as her no-guns-in-the-home rule was obeyed. The freshly turned mounds were marked by two simple white crosses he had fashioned from pickets he'd ripped off their front fence. Angry with her at first, now that it was done, he was glad he hadn't been able to persuade Katie to come out for the burial. Never comfortable displaying or dealing with emotion, he thought he might have lost it completely if she'd come out. One of them needed to stay strong. His sister had taken the deaths of her parents hard. Her grief had been traumatic, so bad he didn't want to think about it. When he'd finally managed to pry her off her parents' bodies, she had retreated to her room and in the thirty or so hours since had only come out to use the bathroom. She refused to eat. Jack knew she would be okay. Or would she? They were alone now. There was nothing on the TV or radio no cell phone reception or internet, and their neighborhood was like a ghost town, 
except for Mr. Dawson across the road. He hadn't appeared sick at all when he'd come over the day before. Was it all over? Maybe neither of them would come out of it. Who knew what would happen next? When his parents had fallen ill, he'd caught snatches of news and there was speculation it was an attack. The phones had been working until two days before, and he'd discussed the whole thing with his best buddy, Danny Cooper. Danny had even heard a report confirming that China was behind the attack, the source of the virus. It's World War III, Jack. I'm telling you, they got us with germ warfare. That conversation, their last, had been interrupted when his father had fallen over in the kitchen. The phones had gone out not long after. They hadn't spoken since. Jack straightened. Danny would be his next task. They'd talked briefly of banding together if, when, the inevitable happened. Now that it had, and he'd taken care of what needed to be done, he wanted to make that connection as soon as possible. Three of them together would definitely stand more of a chance than he and his sister alone. First, though, Katie needed to eat something. He padded upstairs and put his ear to the door and listened. Silence. He knocked gently. Sis? Nothing. Katie? I'm going to have a shower, then I'll make us a sandwich, okay? No answer. Jack felt a wave of panic wash over him. He turned the handle and opened the door a crack, certain he would find Katie with her wrist slashed and bleeding out. She was a shapeless mound underneath the blankets. Only her straggly brown hair showed above the coverlet. He took a step into the room. Katie? Leave me alone. She didn't turn over, and her voice was muffled by the blankets, but he'd never been so glad to hear his sister's whine in his life. He let out a pent-up breath. I'm going to have a shower. Then I'll make you something to eat, okay? Katie, just go away. You can't lay in there forever, he snapped, his patience finally breaking. I'm getting in the shower, and when I'm done, you're getting up. He pulled the door shut with a bang. As it was, it was Jack's resolve that had broken by the time he'd gotten out of the cold shower. When he knocked on Katie's door ten minutes later and she told him to leave her alone, he simply went in and left the PB&J sandwich and a glass of water on her side table. You know, Mom and Dad wouldn't want you to waste away in bed. His voice cracked with emotion. There's a sandwich here. You should eat it. I have to go out tomorrow. She didn't even acknowledge he was there. He shrugged and went back downstairs. After eating his own stale sandwich over the kitchen bench, he went and sat on the living room sofa. He stared at the blank television screen as the last light of day faded. Physically and emotionally drained from burying his parents, his mind wandered back to the laughs and happy times he'd spent with his family in that very spot. Just the week before, they'd binged the last four episodes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, googling when the next series was coming out. What a difference a week made. No more Nine-Nine. No more TV. No more Google. No more parents. Jack stood up, wiping a solitary tear from his eye and headed up to his room. Whether Katie was up tomorrow or not, he was heading out in the morning to try and find Danny. 2. The sun was bright in his window when he awoke, feeling disoriented. It was only a moment before the reality of the last few days chased his sleep-addled confusion down a dark alley. He took a deep breath as he stared at the ceiling. All was quiet outside and inside the house, but there was something different. It took him a second before he realized what it was. He smelled cooking. Someone was cooking eggs. He jumped out of bed and pulled on a T-shirt before heading quickly downstairs. Katie's door was open and her bed was made. Jack felt a tinge of happiness, the first positive emotion he'd felt in many days. Morning, Katie said with a smile when he came through the door. She was pale but almost looked her old self. She was wearing shorts and a sweater and her long brown hair was brushed. She stood over their little propane camping stove stirring scrambled eggs. Morning he said. I wondered how you're cooking with the power out. Good thinking. 
Now was not the time to go into it deep and meaningful. He didn't want to spook her. Yeah, it took me an age to find it in the garage. I'm surprised I didn't wake you with all the noise. I'm not surprised. I slept like the dead. The wooden spoon paused. Really deeply. Katie began stirring again. No toast, unfortunately, she said as she dished the steaming eggs onto two plates. Toaster's not working, of course, but the bread also has spots of mold on it, so... It's cool, he said, taking a mouthful of eggs that he immediately spat out because it was too hot. Hot? Ugh. They both laughed. Just like Mom, Katie said fondly, and took a more carefully curated mouthful herself. Jack nodded and went in for a second forkful. Really nice, thanks, he said, pushing the empty plate into the middle of the counter when he was done. Did you want to come today? I'm not sure about leaving you here on your own. She picked up both plates and carried them to the sink. I'm not ready to go outside yet, she said over the sound of the running water. I'll be safer here than you will be out there. Are you sure you should go? Shouldn't we wait? Maybe help will come. He shook his head. There's no help coming, Katie. I think we've been invaded. That's what the very last news reports were saying. We need to find Danny and work out a plan. Three of us together will stand more of a chance than two. For the first time in days, he saw an emotion other than sadness and anger in her eyes. It was fear. Why? What do you think will happen? I have no idea, but we need to be prepared. In truth, he did have an idea. As a fan of post-apocalyptic books, movies, and TV, he was pretty sure that in the absence of zombies and aliens, it was other survivors they would have to be concerned with first. Even if China was making a full-scale invasion, it could be weeks or months before they had enough people on the ground to invade a little suburb of Sacramento. How long will you be? I'm not sure. I'll drive the Mazda, but how quick I am will depend on what's happening. Danny's is a 15-minute drive normally. Okay, so like less than an hour? Let's say two hours at the outside. We may have to look for supplies. At the very least, bottled water plus other stuff, you know, tools and things we might need. But we have running water. Yeah, but with the power grid down, I'm not sure how much longer it will last. I'm surprised it hasn't been cut already. Okay, sounds like a plan. Try and get food, too, like cans and stuff that will last. Good idea. Anything else? Um, maybe ladies' products? I'm not due for ages, but it would be best to stock up. Jack felt himself blush. While he was a confident teenager and most definitely not a prude, he had never discussed such things with his sister. Okay, he said too quickly. What? I mean, which? She smiled, not unkindly. Don't worry, I'll write it down for you. Thanks. Jack headed back upstairs, amazed at how his sister had swung from being depressed and reclusive to helpful and almost happy. He knew it would take a long time for both of them to get over their parents' deaths, but it gave him confidence that everything would be okay if they made it through the first few weeks. Three. Jack put on jeans, a t-shirt, and his treasured Chuck Taylor Converse high-top shoes. He threw on a hoodie and then looked in the mirror. As far as dressing for the apocalypse, he thought it could have been better. Maybe a leather jacket and some motorcycle boots would have done the trick, but this would have to do. He went to his dresser and pulled out the one piece of survival gear he actually owned. It was a 4.3-inch hunting knife his uncle had sent him for his birthday. He really liked the gift. His mom, not so much. Well, that's practical, she had said with a disapproving look at his father. Well, at least it's not a gun, his dad had joked, receiving a dark look in return. Jack had pulled the all-black knife from its leather sheath and weighed it in his hand, turning it this way and that. His verdict was, it's cool. His mom had been right about its practicality, though. As a family, they were pretty urban, his father didn't hunt or do anything much outdoorsy except camping, and even then, that was always at camping grounds with all the modern conveniences. Since his birthday, they hadn't even done that. 
So it had gone in his drawer and hadn't come out until now. He teared up a little. What he wouldn't do to hear his mom's gentle sarcasm now. Shaking it off, he pulled the blade out of the sheath and jabbed it at the air in front of him a few times. While the blade wasn't as long as the zombie killers in the movies, it would do some damage buried in someone's belly. The key would be to jab and stab. It certainly wasn't a slashing weapon. He lifted the waistband of his hoodie up and clipped the sheath to his belt, then slipped the knife in before covering it back up. Next, he emptied the books and folders from his school backpack into the dustbin. Won't be needing those again. The backpack was pretty beat up after two years of use. He put his finger through a hole in the bottom and decided he'd grab a new one if the opportunity came up. He slipped it over his shoulder and, on autopilot, grabbed his wallet from the dresser on the way through the door. Katie was wiping down the kitchen benches when he got downstairs. That was a rare sight, and he was about to make a joke when he noticed her red-rimmed eyes. As if to distract him from the fact she'd been upset, she smiled and pointed to a water bottle, two Milky Ways, and a note written in her small, neat handwriting on the end of the counter. Just in case it's a while before you find more food. And that's the note with my stuff on it. Thanks, sis. He placed the water and candy bars in the backpack and slipped the note into his pocket. Okay, he said. I guess I'll see you in two hours. Make sure you lock the door after me, and if anyone knocks, don't answer. If there's an emergency or anything, run straight over the road to Mr. Dawson's. I can't believe he's alive. I thought it killed all of them, like all of the adults. Apparently not, he shrugged. I don't really like him. He's okay. A little bit arrogant, but Dad thought he was okay. Besides, it's good to have someone if we need help. I guess, she said in a strange tone. He could almost read her mind. How come Dawson had survived and not Mom or Dad? He turned and headed to the door before she had a chance to get upset again. Um, I think you'll need these. She scooped the keys to the CX-5 off the top of the microwave and he held out his hands to catch them. She didn't throw them. Instead, she carried them to him and dropped them in his open hand. Thanks. Then she did something she hadn't done in many years. She hugged him. It was brief and too quick for him to return, but he knew it was a huge deal, and he felt the warmth of the hug deep in his soul. Be careful, she said. I will. Don't forget, lock the door. He pulled it open and stepped out into the gray morning. He turned and waved one more time. She waved back before closing the door. He heard the deadbolt click. Then, headed for his mother's pride and joy, the Mazda SUV was only six months old and the smell of new leather was still strong when he opened the door. He put his backpack on the passenger seat and then started it. The engine fired up the first time and he turned the heater on right away, along with the seat warmers. He buckled up and then put his hands on the wheel. He was a little nervous. Being on a learner's permit, he'd only ever driven it with his mom or dad next to him, and that wasn't the only thing causing his nerves. Also playing on his mind was the fact he was about to find out a little more about the fall of America. Quite frankly, he didn't know what was happening out there, and it scared him. He took a deep breath and reversed the Mazda out onto the road. He was about to head out when he decided at the last second to stop and run in to talk to Mr. Dawson. It wouldn't hurt just to have him keep an eye on things while he was gone, and not only that, he felt he had been a little rude to the guy when he had come over to check on them two days before. Jack pulled the car to a stop in front of his neighbor's home and turned it off before stepping back out into the cold Sacramento morning. Something niggled at the back of his mind as he followed the path to the front door. It was a vague sense of something not being quite right. It was like that feeling you get when you go past a place you haven't seen in a while and something's different about it. Then you work out it's something like a tree having been cut down or a vacant lot where a building used to be. He worked out what it was as he stepped up onto the front porch. It was the quiet. Normally there'd be street noises at this time of day. Cars, lawnmowers, planes flying overhead. He couldn't even hear a bird. It was jarring. He didn't have long to think about it. The door was pulled open before he had a chance to knock. Mr. Dawson stood in the doorway smiling, half hidden behind the door. 4. 
Movement at last. Dawson had been drinking a mug of instant coffee at the study window when Katie's blinds were opened. And there she is, folks, he muttered, moving to the side, even though he knew full well no one could see in through the sheer nylon curtains in the daytime. He checked. Come on, honey, he said, putting his coffee mug down and leaning forward. Let Uncle Larry have a look at you. There was no movement for a minute. Then she appeared. It was brief. She put her face to the pane and peered up and down the street. She wore a white tank top that left little to Larry's imagination, even though it was perfectly acceptable sleepwear for a girl in the privacy of her own home. Good morning, sunshine. Glad to see you up bright and early. It's gonna be a big day. Katie disappeared from the window a few seconds later, her curiosity apparently satisfied. Disappointed it was over so fast, but pleased by his first dose of Katie in a week, Larry picked up his coffee and whistled happily as he headed downstairs. On the kitchen island sat the gear he'd brought up from the basement. He fingered the blade of the knife absently and went over the plan in his mind. First, he'd take care of the boy. He decided he'd go the direct route, knock on the front door, just like he had a few days ago, lure him over to his house with a story about how he needed help to move something, then overpower and kill him. The kid was big for his age, but Larry was bigger. His physique was vaguely ape-like. He was barrel-chested with arms that were long and ropey with muscle, and he had slim hips despite his solid beer belly. His red hair was graying now, but back when he'd moved school in the eighth grade, a group of kids had called him orangutan. That had stopped right after he put their ringleader in a chokehold and squeezed until the asshole passed out. It had taken three teachers to get him off the bully, and he'd had to move school not long after, but no one had ever called him that name again. Larry Dawson didn't really want to kill Jack, but if he didn't, the kid would just become a problem later, a problem that had to be fed and watered and watched constantly. No, best to put him out of his misery right away. So, he thought, lure the boy, kill him, then grab Katie. Three simple steps. He made another cup of instant coffee from water he heated on the gas stove and sipped it occasionally as he packed his Katie kit. It was a satchel containing the things he would need to ensure Katie was compliant when he went to get her. He left the carving knife out. It would go into the pack after he'd taken care of the boy. He drained the last of his coffee and put it on the counter. Okay, time to get this done. He picked up the knife and satchel and headed into the hallway. He dropped the satchel on the floor by the front door and was about to deposit the knife in the drawer of the hallway console table when he heard the muffled sound of a car door closing. What the hell? He kept a hold of the knife and went through to the living room. As he peered through the front curtains, the reverse lights on Beverly Monaghan's Mazda lit up and it backed out of their driveway. He checked Katie's window in the front yard. There was no one in sight. No! Had he waited too long? Were they leaving? He peered desperately into the car, only calming down once he saw it was the boy in the driver's seat and that he was alone. The car reversed onto the road, then jerked to a halt before easing forward and heading off. Dawson couldn't believe his luck. Now he could snatch Katie and not have to kill the kid. He was about to do a little jig in celebration when the car skidded to a halt and began to back up. It stopped directly in front of his house and the kid climbed out. Dawson's fingers tightened around the handle of the carving knife and he headed back to the front door. Back to plan A. As the kid's shadow appeared through the frosted glass, he stepped up to the door, a fake smile plastered over his face, and pulled it open, careful to keep the knife out of sight. Startled, his young neighbor stopped in his tracks. Hey, kiddo, said Dawson. What a coincidence. I was just going to come and ask if you could help me with something. Five. Katie finished wiping down the kitchen benches, doing her best not to think about anything. When she was done, she looked around for something else to do, and her eyes fell upon the fridge. She almost welcomed the stench of decay that assaulted her senses. 
anything to keep her mind off her parents lying in the cold dirt of their backyard. Tears sprang to her eyes again. The grief was quick and unexpected. Just her conscious mind touching upon her parents was enough to turn on the waterworks. God, stop it, Katie, she moaned, slamming the fridge door and heading to the kitchen drawers. She ripped some kitchen trash bags out of their box and stalked back to the refrigerator. After fifteen minutes, she had cleared the shelves, filling two bags with an assortment of spoiled food and containers of unmentionable leftovers. Katie finished by sweeping the tiled floor and then headed back upstairs. Following a cold shower, she dressed in sweatpants and a T-shirt, then went back to her room. After so long lying in bed, the quick burst of activity had depleted her energy, and she decided to lay down and read. She went to the window first and took another look up and down the street. Apart from the leaves blowing in the wind, there was no movement anywhere. Theirs was an established neighborhood, and there had been no other families with kids in the cul-de-sac they lived on. Her gaze traveled to the homes across the way. No kids meant the houses were populated only by the dead now. Well, all except the Dawsons. She glanced at the neat brick bungalow. It was just as still and vacant-looking as the others. Katie shivered and drew the blinds. She couldn't concentrate on her book and just stared up at the ceiling. She let her eyes close, deciding she'd get up when Jack got back with Danny. After a while, she fell into a fitful sleep. Hey, Mr. Dawson, really? What do you need help with? said Jack, thinking that for someone who had recently lost his wife, his neighbor sure was cheerful. Dawson waved vaguely towards the rear of the house. I just need a hand moving a cabinet in the basement. Darn thing is heavier than I thought. I can help you with that for sure, Larry smiled. If he could get the kid into the basement with no fuss and then take care of him, it would be much easier, not to mention less mess to clean up in the house. But do you mind if I help you this afternoon? I'm heading over to the north side to try and find my buddy and get some supplies. The older man stared right through him for a second before his eyes focused again. Oh, you are, Dawson said. Yeah, that's why I dropped in, actually. Katie is staying home, so I was going to ask if you'd mind keeping an eye on our place. I'll only be gone a couple hours. Well, uh, sure, kiddo. Larry tried to keep the excitement out of his voice. It appeared the universe was delivering again. Happy to lend a neighborly hand. So you're going now? Yes, sir. Okay, not a problem. I'm just working in the basement, but I'll come up now and then to make sure it's all good. It's a bummer what happened and all, but if we all stick together, we should be fine. A bummer? Understatement much? Sure. Did you want me to get anything for you? Jack asked to be polite. No, son, unless you trip over a six-pack of cores, said Larry Dawson, smiling and twisting the handle of his hidden knife absent-mindedly. You be careful. This is the end of the world, after all. No way to tell what lunatics are on the loose out there. Sure will. Jack got back into the car and pulled away, feeling a little unsettled. He had a sneaking suspicion Mr. Dawson might be losing it a little. Couldn't blame him, but he decided it might be better to avoid their neighbor from now on. He talked to Katie about it when he got back. He wondered briefly if Larry had buried Mrs. Dawson or if she was still in the house somewhere. Hell, maybe he'd stowed her in the cabin and he wanted help to move. Jack chuckled more to make himself feel better. The morbid thought was anything but amusing. After he turned onto the main street of their little suburb, though, he forgot all about Mr. Dawson and everything else for a while. Six. Katie dreamed. She was walking on a beach. About thirty feet ahead were her parents, who were walking side by side. The forbidding clouds were low in the sky, and a gentle breeze brushed her face. Something was wrong. She called them, but they didn't answer, didn't even turn to look over their shoulders at her. She began to run, but the sand under her feet gave way with each footfall, and soon she found herself ankle-deep, falling to her knees in the soft sand as her parents walked on, oblivious. "'Mom! Dad! Wait!' She struggled to lift her feet out of the sand but its grip tightened. She looked down. There were teeth in the sand. 
Katie gasped and sat bolt upright in bed. The pain in her ankles didn't abate upon waking. In the dim of her room, she could see a shape leaning over her. Katie opened her mouth to scream. A hand fell over her mouth. She reached up and clawed at the hand. It was warm and dry against her mouth and didn't budge, even as she scratched and dug her fingernails into the skin. She stopped struggling when she felt a cold, thin line of steel pressed against her vulnerable throat. That's better, said a menacing male voice near her ear. I don't want to hurt a hair on your pretty head, but if you scratch me again, I'll gut you like a fish. He let that sink in for a moment. Nod if you understand. With her heart beating fast enough to explode, Katie nodded. She allowed herself to calm down, and as the reptilian fight-or-flight response in her brain subsided, her conscious brain kicked in. She knew exactly who was in her bedroom. It was Larry Dawson. Now I'm going to take my hand away. Remember what I said. Katie took several deep breaths when he released her. What are you doing? No questions. I need some light. The shadowy figure stepped towards the window. Katie took her chance immediately and flung herself off the bed and promptly fell face first to the floor. Her forehead cracked against the floorboards and she rolled over, squinting in the light that now filled her bedroom. He walked over to her, chuckling. I guess tying your ankles was the right thing to do. He looked over her body appreciatively. No way I could catch a fit little thing like you. Katie felt a wave of nausea wash over her. Whether it was from hitting her head or his disgusting gaze, she had no idea. What do you want? She asked. You, he said, as he knelt next to her and reached into a gym bag on the floor next to him. I've wanted you for a long time. Let me go, you fucking freak! Katie's words were cut off by the hand again. This time it smoothed something over her mouth and withdrew immediately. It was a square of heavy-duty duct tape, and when she reached up to remove it, he slapped her hand away. She tried a second time, and he batted it away again. She didn't try again. Just watched him as her brain worked manically to find a way out of her predicament. That's better he said. I'll have to punish you for your disrespect, but that can wait till later. Katie's eyes blazed with anger, and she slapped him hard across the face. It surprised him, but he slapped her right back twice as hard. Stunned, she crumpled on the floor. The fight knocked out of her. Wasting no more time, he pulled out a long zip tie, the same as he used to tie her ankles, and secured her hands behind her back. Katie moaned as the nylon cut into her skin. No one to blame but yourself, he admonished, and he began putting the things he'd taken out of the gym bag away again. Katie's eyes widened when she saw him pick up the long carving knife and tuck it into the bag before zipping it up. He stood up and placed the bag on the bed before bending over and picking up Katie as if she weighed nothing. He slung her over his shoulder before picking up the bag and heading out. Katie didn't know what to do. Should she fight and risk more punishment? or bide her time until the odds were more in her favor. Come home now, please, Jack. Her captor took her out through the back door he had broken into and closed it before carrying her down the side of the house. She looked around frantically as he carried her through the side gate and into the front yard, but her long hair effectively obscured her view of anything but the ground and a few feet in either direction. Katie strained to hear the sound of a car as she giddily watched his booted feet walking her down the driveway. There was no car, no sound of anything for that matter. Where was Jack? As he stepped off the driveway and onto the road, Katie began to cry. Once she was in that house, she knew she wasn't coming out. Hey, mister, what are you doing? Katie's head jerked up at the strange voice as her captor stopped in his tracks. 7. There was no one around in the center of town, and Main Street was a mess. Broken windows, a burnt-out car, upturned trash cans. Jack navigated the CX-5 around a twisted shopping cart in the middle of the road. Its contents were strewn across both lanes. 
and he didn't want to think about the large, dark stain on the asphalt next to it. After he was past the shopping cart, he peered into the shattered windows of the Costco. It was dark, and he strained to see inside. He touched the brakes and came to a halt. He thought he saw movement. He had. Figures materialized from the dark as first one, then two, then more kids erupted from the store and began running towards his car, screaming and yelling. They ranged in age from about twelve to sixteen. He thought they were running for his help at first. He was wrong, and he knew it when he spotted the knives, baseball bats, and was that a crossbow? Amazed at what he saw, he didn't react for a second. Then he heard a sharp pop behind him and turned to find a bullet hole in the window of the rear door. Shit! Jack ducked as low as he could and planted his foot on the gas as the gang rushed the car. He was away before they reached him, but heard several objects strike the Mazda as he sped away. He didn't relax until he turned the corner a half mile away, and even then, his hands were trembling with the adrenaline coursing through his system. Holy shit! He kept his speed up for the rest of the drive, only slowing when he had to. He didn't come across any more gangs, or anyone else for that matter, before he turned onto Danny's street. The front door to Danny's house opened as he crossed the front lawn. Dude, you're alive, called his friend, rushing out to meet him. Jack immediately spotted the pistol tucked into the belt of his friend's jeans. Yeah, you too. Where did you get that? He asked as they grasped each other's hand and shoulder bumped. It's Dad's, he said, pulling it out and showing Jack. It's a Beretta. There's only one, though. Sorry. I didn't know he had one. I did. I wasn't allowed to tell anyone, though. It was for protection. Okay, fair enough. So, is he... I mean, did he... Yeah, Danny said solemnly. He died the day after Christmas. What about yours? Jack nodded. Sorry, man, he said, putting his hand on Jack's shoulder. Same. Danny looked around. Come inside. I haven't seen anyone around, but it's better if we're not out in the open. You're telling me. Danny gave Jack a bottle of water when they'd settled at the kitchen table, and Jack told him what he'd seen in the center of town. His friend was surprised things had deteriorated so quickly. So you still want to join up with me and Katie? Jack asked. He knew the answer. They'd pretty much worked it out before the communications went down. The only downside to the whole scenario was the fact that Danny had a major crush on Katie and could get awkward around her. Hell yeah, said Danny. I don't have any other plans. I mean, what else are we supposed to do? Survive, I guess. Hide? Wait for help? Yeah, I don't think help is coming. The last reports I heard were that the Chinese were invading and that they'd threatened immediate retaliation on any country that tried to stop them. Why are they doing it? Who knows? But one thing's for sure, no one here can stop them. What are a bunch of kids going to do? They can just walk right in and take over everything. Transport, infrastructure, weapons, everything. What about the kids, though? Why didn't they just kill everyone? Dunno. I guess we're going to find out soon enough. You think they'll come here? Yeah, I reckon. It's the capital of the state. I think they'll probably make their base in every state capital and fan out from there. Shit, said Jack. That makes sense. Maybe we should get out and go across the border into Nevada? Nevada? Are you kidding, dude? It's a fucking desert. No, if we were going to do that, north into Oregon would be the way to go. Yeah, it's a long way, though, said Jack. Hey, maybe we wouldn't have to go interstate. El Dorado was only a little over an hour's drive east on the Lincoln Highway. We could hide out in there easy enough. Danny high-fived him. Awesome idea. Let's do it. They spent the next thirty minutes loading up the back of the CX-5 with non-perishable food and other supplies from Danny's. Lucky my dad went shopping a few days before, before he got sick. Jack could tell his friend was on the verge of tears and moved the conversation along quickly for both their sakes. Yeah, it worked out well. We should have a pretty good supply once we add in what we have at home, too. Do you think we should take any tools? Good thinking. Come on, said Danny, perking up. They went out back to his dad's garden shed and picked up a small axe, a hammer, and a rope. 
On the way back out front, Danny ran up onto the back veranda and grabbed his aluminum baseball bat. My zombie whacker. Jack laughed. They packed the new additions into the car and he waited while Danny headed inside to grab some clothes. He came back with a duffel bag over his shoulder and a small box under his arm. After tossing the bag in the back, he climbed in and showed Jack the box. It was full of CDs. Some music for the road. Cool. Jack started the car as Danny pulled out a disc and slid it into the player. A distinctive electric guitar riff began emanating from the speaker. He recognized it immediately. Alive by Pearl Jam. He laughed and slapped the wheel. Very appropriate, dude. Danny, pleased with himself, began playing air guitar to Eddie Vedder's distinctive voice, and Jack soon joined in on vocals. They'd both become fans when Danny's father had introduced them to 90s rock the year before. There was real rock and roll before this stuff, but not much since, Mr. Cooper had said dryly as he handed them a bunch of CDs. Give it a listen. It'll change your world. And he was right. It had changed their world. A little, at least. They'd become 90s rock aficionados and spent a lot of their hangout time together listening to the Smashing Pumpkins, Soundgarden, and the Chili Peppers. But Pearl Jam and Nirvana were their favorites. They often argued about whether Nirvana would have been bigger than Pearl Jam if Kurt Cobain hadn't killed himself, with Jack firmly in the no camp. How could they have, dude? Half the reason they're as famous as they are is that he did kill himself, he had opined once. As for current music, neither of the boys were really into it, although Jack secretly enjoyed Taylor Swift before she went all dark and vengeful. We better avoid Main Street, said Danny as the next song began playing. Turn here and I'll take you another way. Not as quick, but sure better than being shot at again. 8. Dawson turned slowly in the direction of the voice, like a dog caught running away with its owner's favorite slipper. Katie craned her neck to try and see who had spoken. Through the curtain of hair, she saw a pair of sneakers topped by jeans. From the size of the shoes, she figured it was a boy of maybe eleven or twelve. Katie began wriggling and yelling into the tape over her mouth. Help me, please. Well, hey, sport, said Dawson, straining to keep the struggling girl on his shoulder. Just helping a friend here. Someone broke into her house and tied her up. I was just taking her to see if I had something to cut these ties they put on her. I don't think she wants to go with you. Katie renewed her struggles and muffled yelling as Dawson weighed this up. I don't fucking care what you think, said Dawson, his pleasant tone changing to something more sinister. What are you doing here anyway? Fuck off and mind your own business. No. It's a free country. You better put her down, mister. I can tell she doesn't want to go with you. Put her down or what? snapped Dawson. Then he paused and sighed deeply. His tone changed again. Now it became weary and regretful. You know what, kid? Maybe you're right. Sorry, I've been a bit tense since my wife died. He dropped the bag and then eased Katie to the road. I guess in times like these we should be cooperating, not fighting about things, right? He held up his hands, palm out. Katie, now on her back, got a good look at the kid. He was Joe Average, sandy-colored hair with a spattering of freckles, dressed in jeans and a black hoodie with Chewbacca on the front. He was unarmed, but he didn't look frightened, just wary. Upon laying eyes on him, Katie understood two things. The kid wasn't going to be her savior, and he was in grave danger. She glared at him, shaking her head and trying to warn him with her eyes, but his attention was on the man in front of him. How about a peace offering? You look hungry, Dawson said, twisting as he bent over and reached into the bag. I have some candy bars and a Dr. Pepper somewhere in here. You can have a snack and then help me untie her. Run! Katie tried to scream. The kid took an uncertain step forward, even as the stranger stood upright and turned towards him, with cold steel death in his hands. The shotgun blast to the kid's chest lifted him off his feet and hurled him back onto the roadway, a fine mist of his own blood settling onto the asphalt around him. Katie's ears rung from the blast. 
and she knew he was dead immediately. Through tear-blurred eyes, she watched as Dawson stalked towards the body, stopping a few feet short. See what you made me do, kid? He screamed down at the boy, not willing to go any closer to his own handiwork. He moved from foot to foot for a minute before looking back at Katie. Shit! He ran across the road to his next-door neighbors and wheeled their trash can out onto the road, pulling it to a stop beside the body of the boy. Katie closed her eyes. She didn't want to watch. The sound of the body falling into the bin with a light thud and the familiar drummy neighborhood sound as it was wheeled back across the road were bad enough. She opened her eyes when Dawson returned after cleaning up his dirty deed. He didn't look at her as he put the shotgun back in the bag. He was pale, and his eyes had a wild look to them. Katie was in shock and didn't have long to think about what had just happened before her eyes. As soon as he had the bag zipped up, Dawson stood and threw her over his shoulder again before picking up the bag. She didn't have the strength to struggle this time. She had just witnessed the cold-blooded murder of a boy, and knew that her fate was now in the hands of a psychopath. Dawson was too big, too well-armed, and too crazy to be stopped by anything she could do. When Jack returned... She hoped he was smart enough to work that out. Maybe it was better that Jack doesn't come back, she thought as Dawson unlocked his front door and carried her over the threshold. Her situation was dire, and she just prayed that it would be quick. Unfortunately, Katie was wrong. Now that she was in his clutches, Larry Dawson had no intention of killing her. She was his for keeps and nothing he had in mind would be quick or easy. Nine. Jack turned onto his street two and a half hours after he had set out for Danny's. Nothing appeared amiss in the cul-de-sac until he was about to turn into his driveway. What's that? asked Danny, pointing at a dark patch on the road about ten feet beyond the driveway. Jack opened the driver's window and stuck his head out to look as he slowly turned into the driveway. Not sure, he said, pulling his head back in and parking the car. I'll have a look. He got out and pocketed the keys as he walked across the yard and out onto the road. Danny followed just behind. That's not good, said Danny as they looked down at the bloody mess. There was a sticky puddle of blood surrounded by a fine spray pattern of red. Jack felt his breakfast begin to churn in his stomach as his friend squatted and put the tip of his finger into the blood. Don't touch. This is pretty recent, he said, looking curiously at the film of red on his finger. It hasn't started congealing. What do you think happened? asked Jack. Danny looked at him, his face a few shades paler than it had been before they pulled up. Pretty sure someone was blown away. Jack's vision darkened at the edges. Katie! He turned without another word and sprinted for the front door, rummaging in his pocket for the keys as he went. Jack, wait! Danny called. If something had happened to Katie, it would be best if he saw first. Jack didn't wait, though. He plunged the key into the door and ran into the house and up the stairs with Danny hot on his heels. Katie, screamed Jack, bursting through the door and skidding to a halt in front of her empty bed. Danny stopped him. The bed was disheveled, the sheets pulled off and bunched on the floor. Jesus, said Jack. Let's search the rest of the house, said Danny. She may be hiding. They spent ten minutes searching the house, only stopping when Jack found the splintered wood around the back door handle. By then it was clear she was no longer in the house. They took her he said in a quiet voice as they headed back into the kitchen. Who do you think it was? Danny asked. Have you seen anyone hanging around? Jack collapsed into a chair at the dining table. No, it's been like a ghost town here. It was mainly older people in this street. I haven't seen anyone but Mr. Dawson. Who? The guy across the road, said Jack, looking at Danny, horror slowly enveloping him. He didn't get sick and... Oh, shit. 
I asked him to keep an eye out on our place when I went to get you. I basically told him Katie was on her own. Do you know if he had a shotgun? Don't know. He doesn't look the type, but I guess it's possible. You don't think she's... No, I don't think she's dead. And I don't know who got shot out there, but I don't think it's Katie. How can you be so sure? Well, I can't be. Not 100% anyway. But it seems our only suspect is Mr. Dawson, so if it was him, why would he drag Katie out onto the road and shoot her? Jack shook his head. Okay, if it's someone else's blood, that means Katie is still missing. Why would he come and take her? Because he's a filthy pervert, spat Jack. Danny nodded. So, if he is a pervert, he's not going to waste her, right? He wouldn't want to hurt her. Not yet, anyway. First he would want... Yeah, I got it, said Jack, standing up and holding out his hand. Give me your gun. Danny held up his hands placatingly. I will, but let's think this through. The guy's not stupid, right? No, said Jack, with his hand still held out. And... Danny stood up and pushed his friend's hand down. He's going to expect you to work it out and run over there with all guns blazing. If he's waiting for that, then he's not bothering Katie right now. I say we go out and make a show of searching for Katie. We'll knock on his door, but calmly, without accusations, and ask if he knows what happened. And then what? Then we'll make a show of leaving later this afternoon, before sundown. Jack shook his head, but Danny ignored him. Then, he said firmly, we come back under cover of darkness and break into his place. When we find Katie and get her out, you can go all Rambo on his ass. Jack's jaw was clenched as he processed Danny's plan. Laid out before him like that, it made perfect sense. Finally, he nodded. Ten. After carrying Katie like a sack of potatoes down into his basement, Dawson had placed her on what she could only think of as a slab with handcuffs attached to each corner. She looked around the basement with big eyes. It was dark and dank, with cobwebs on the exposed timber of the ceiling. It was straight out of a horror movie. A deep, cold fear began to creep into her bones. Sorry if that's uncomfortable, he said, referring to the table or whatever it was she was lying on. I'll bring you a pillow down later. Those were the first words he'd spoken to her since killing the kid. She almost told him to go fuck himself, but stopped herself in the hope she might yet find a way out of this mess, or at least bide some time for Jack to find her. Thanks. The word felt like ashes on her tongue, and he seemed surprised at her submission. He didn't speak for a few seconds before nodding. Sorry, I have to do this. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a black bandana, placing it over her eyes and tying it quickly and efficiently. Her fear level went up a notch. She opened her mouth to begin the spiel she'd heard dozens of actresses say in horror movies over the years. You don't want to do this. It's not too late to let me go but found something spongy and round pushed rudely into her mouth. She struggled to turn away, but he grabbed her by the hair and shoved it in, mashing her lip painfully against her teeth in the process. She tasted blood in her mouth. Katie stopped struggling, shocked by the sudden violence. That's better, he said, loosening his grip on her hair before raising her head and securing the straps of a gag. Don't fight me and you won't get hurt. She felt his nasty hands on her and exhaled slowly when all he did was cut the zip tie securing her hands. She rubbed her wrists to get the blood flowing again, and he seemed content to let her do this, but as soon as she had relaxed, he grasped her left wrist and pulled it up to the top corner of the slab. He clicked the handcuff closed. Katie tried to resist as he gripped her other hand, but he was too strong. Dawson freed her ankles of the zip tie next. Ignoring his warning, Katie kicked and lashed out with her feet, managing to score a direct hit to his belly with one blind push. She heard the breath whoosh out of his lungs. He paused and stepped away from the table for a minute as he got his breath back. Then he got back to wrangling her, this time a little more carefully. 
By the time he had secured both of her legs, they were both puffing with exertion. She heard footsteps come up beside her and then felt his warm breath on her ear. She tensed. One, two, three seconds. Then his finger touched her cheek. She pulled away and turned her face, but it found her again, this time trailing down her cheek, under her chin, and then on to her throat, where it lingered before worming its way under the collar of her T-shirt. Katie shuddered in revulsion and the finger left her. Suddenly he gripped her chin painfully. I'll give you a free pass on that kick because I know you're frightened, but that's your final warning. Now I must go upstairs. I'm expecting a visitor, so don't go anywhere. Tonight is going to be something, something special. She heard his heavy footsteps on the stairs to the kitchen, followed by a door slamming and a bolt sliding home. She was alone. That was good. She was restrained and locked in a psychopath's basement. That was bad. And who is the visitor he was referring to? The emphasis he put on the word told her it wasn't going to be an invited guest. Then it dawned on her that he meant Jack. No! She pulled at the restraints. They had some slack, but the cuffs were securely anchored. She couldn't move any of her limbs more than a couple of inches. Jack was in danger. He would almost certainly come over to Mr. Dawson's when he found her missing, even if he didn't suspect it was him. Where else would a teenage boy go but to the, for all they knew, only surviving adult in their suburb, possibly the whole city? Tears of rage spilled from her eyes as she struggled, and the raw anger started to melt some of her icy fear. Jack was all she had left, and if the bastard touched a hair on his head, she would kill him. 11. Jack and Danny made a show of searching for Katie in the street. They started with the house next door and went along the cul-de-sac peering in windows and calling through doors. All the while, Jack surreptitiously watched Dawson's home. There was nothing, not even the flicker of a curtain. This, if anything, reinforced Jack's conviction that he was guilty and that Katie was in his house at that very moment. With each passing minute, he became angrier and more frantic. After he bashed at the door of his neighbor four doors down and waited the prerequisite thirty seconds with no answer, he turned and stormed off the porch. This is pointless, he said to Danny. I'm ending it now. Danny, resigned to a preemptive strike, said, Okay, okay, and jogged to catch up to Jack, only catching him halfway across the road. That was when he noticed that Dawson's neighbor's trash bin was standing askew to the other one. It struck him as odd, because everything else about the yard was neat and tidy. The lawns, the gardens. In fact, it was an immaculately presented suburban home. Jack, wait. Let me check this out before we go storming up to his doorstep. He jogged over to the bin, but slowed when he saw a smear of brown on the lid and edge. He realized immediately that it was blood. Danny looked back over his shoulder and realized his mistake immediately. Jack had seen the look on his face and began walking across. Shit, breathed Danny. If Katie was somehow squashed into that bin, there was no way he could allow Jack to see her. With his pulse beating in his ear, he stepped up to the bin and lifted the lid. It took a moment for his eyes to register what he was seeing, and then he let out a yelp of shock and let the lid drop. Jack reached him as he fell to his knees and wretched up the contents of his stomach. What is it? asked Jack on the verge of tears. It's Katie, isn't it? Danny, on his knees, wiped his mouth and shook his head before heaving again, this time failing to bring up anything. No, it's not. You don't want to look, though. Jack ignored his friend and lifted the lid. What he saw sent a jolt of disconnect through his brains. The blood-smeared face of a young boy, his eyes wide in shock, rested against the side of his terrible blood-smeared coffin. He had been placed feet first in the bin, his body settling awkwardly in an almost fetal position. Jack had buried his own parents barely twenty-four hours before. But the shocking sight of a kid in the trash bin jarred his senses and brought home the reality of his situation. 
He closed the lid and rested his hand on it, almost tenderly, as Danny climbed to his feet beside him. Are you okay? Jack asked, his face grim. Danny nodded. It had to be him, right? Yeah, said Jack. That means he's armed. We shouldn't. I mean, we better not try. You don't have to. She's my sister. Wait here. Wait here. Jack turned and went around the juniper trees that formed a barrier between Dawson's house and his neighbor's front yard. It was only when Danny heard him banging on the front door that he realized he still had the pistol in his pocket. Shit. Danny went to the end tree and watched with the gun now in hand. He would run to Jack's aid if he needed help. Jack banged on the door again. There were no glass panels in the door or set into the frame around it, and it felt rock solid, barely trembling in the frame when he hit it. Dawson! He thought he heard a noise behind the door. He hadn't really thought about the possibility that Dawson might try and blow a hole in him through the door, but he was pretty sure if he tried, the door would soak up most of the damage. Mr. Dawson? Nothing. He glanced back at Danny, who was watching from the edge of the road, his hand behind his back. Clearly, he had now taken out his gun. His friend shrugged. Jack decided to change tack. Mr. Dawson, have you seen Katie? She's missing. Still nothing. Jack banged the door with the heel of his hand in frustration. He wanted to kick the door in, but knew it would be suicide. He turned from the door and went back out to Danny. He's in there. I heard him. Did he say anything? No, he was just waiting, like a spider in the dark. What do you want to do? I want to break in there and kill his ass, but I know he'll be waiting for that. Even if we go around and try and break in the back way. I guess we go back to the original plan and do what you said. But we have to keep him interested so he stays away from Katie in the meantime. Danny nodded, thankful that Jack had tempered his eagerness and hoping that Katie was all right. The body in the bin had driven home to him that this was no game and that Jack's sister and they themselves were in imminent danger. He hoped that even waiting until dark would give them enough time to rescue Katie. He didn't verbalize this to Jack, of course. Okay, let's do it, he said. Why don't we make a show of going up and down the street again? This time we'll go into each house and break in some doors or windows to keep them interested. Well, then why don't we take the car, too? If we're breaking in... We may as well grab canned food or shelf-stable milk and stuff. Who knows, we might even find weapons or tools we can take, too. They did just that. Over the next few hours, they broke into houses of Jack's former neighbors and gathered supplies they could take with them when they left for the El Dorado Forest. Katie was a constant, nagging worry in the back of his mind, and he made sure to yell strongly for her every ten minutes or so, not only for the benefit of Mr. Dawson, but also in the hopes that Katie would hear him and know he hadn't given up on her. They only saw one dead body during their searches, a man that Jack only knew as Sam, three doors down from their house. He sat in his living room in front of a black TV screen, staring at the ceiling, the skin on his face parchment gray and a good portion of it crusted with dried snot. Danny threw a blanket over his head. While it wasn't pleasant to see, the body of Sam was nothing compared to the horror in the bin, and they both went about their business without being too affected. Jack did a call-out hello a few times, as he did in every house. He assumed that Sam's wife Beth was somewhere in the house, probably upstairs, but there was no way he was going up to check. After searching five houses, and three and a half hours later, they had packed the rear of the SUV full of non-perishable food and drink, and had also managed to gather an arsenal of items that could be used as weapons if the need arose. A baseball bat, assorted knives, a decorative samurai sword that Danny insisted could be sharpened, a BB gun, and a slingshot. Every hour or so, Jack would head to Dawson's house and hammer on the door and call out asking if he'd seen Katie. There was never a reply, but each time Jack knew the man was in there. He could feel him probably just waiting for him to make the mistake of breaking in the door. Do you think we're keeping him busy enough to stay away from Katie? He asked Danny upon returning from his fourth visit to Dawson's store. I do. 
I saw the curtains on that room on the second story moving just then. If he's got her, I'm pretty sure she's in the basement. I mean, that's what all the psychos seem to do, right? She could be up there, though. Danny put a hand on his arm. Jack, we've waited this long. Nothing's changed since we made the decision to start this. If we try to break in, he'll use the shotgun. The shutters are down on all the side windows, and you can be sure he's barricaded the back door. We need him to be off guard when we make our move. Jack nodded, his face unhappy. He felt like Dawson had all the control in this situation, and it was driving him nuts. We have one thing in our favor. He doesn't know we've seen the body of the kid. That part of the neighbor's yard is blocked from his view by the trees. And with you waltzing up there and knocking on the door, he won't suspect it. So he doesn't know that we know what he's willing to do. I say we wait for the sun to set, then try knocking one more time before we get in the car and drive out. He'll wonder why we left without trying harder. Will he? asked Danny. I think he'll be so eager to get back to his prize that he won't ask too many questions. Maybe we should have a mock argument in the street where I convince you we can't hang around any longer. He doesn't even have to hear us as long as he gets that we had a disagreement and that I won. Okay. Good. It's going to get dark in about an hour. Let's go back to your house and work out a plan of attack. 12. Dawson had run down from his study, surprisingly agile for a heavyset man, when he saw young Jack approaching his property for the fourth time. He was becoming more and more frustrated with every passing hour. All he wanted to do was get back down to Katie, and instead he had to monitor what these two young idiots were doing. Just as Jack climbed up onto his porch, he reached the front door and pointed his shotgun at the white painted hardwood. Come on, you little shit. Break in. I dare you. Again, though, the kid turned away when he didn't answer the knock or the calls. Dawson nearly screamed in frustration. He decided that next time he would pull the door open himself and shoot the kid where he stood. He ran back up the stairs, shotgun in hand, and pulled the curtain aside to see what the little bastards were up to. He quickly dropped it when he saw the other kid looking directly up at him. He knew the kid couldn't have seen much besides the curtain moving, but he gave it a minute before he peered through a little more carefully. They were backing the car out of the Connor's driveway. He silently willed them to keep going once they were on the road, but they turned back into Jack's driveway and got back out and headed inside. They'd done a good job of looting the neighbors' houses, and Dawson briefly wondered if he should have been out doing that too. No, he had more important things to attend to. After he'd had some fun with Katie, he could begin to worry about more practical matters, like keeping them both alive for a long, long time. The boys obviously had a plan. If they were loading up the car, it indicated they wouldn't be hanging around, otherwise why not just use a wheelbarrow to move the goods into the house? The question was, would they come looking for Katie again before they left? Before he'd been spotted at the window, he supposed there'd been a chance they might have thought he'd gone, with or without Katie, but even they couldn't be dumb enough to believe it now. After five minutes of watching the house across the road, he grew bored. He looked at the dead computer regretfully before putting his shotgun down and unlocking the desk drawer. He slowly opened it and pulled out his Katie file. It was a black plastic folder with clear display sleeves. In each was a piece of A4 paper upon which he had printed out color pictures of Katie. They were images he'd saved and printed from her Instagram and Facebook pages. He took it back to the window and flicked through them, glancing occasionally across the road. It was a fifty-page folder, and it was packed full of color images. One thing he'd discovered since he began stalking Katie was that teenage girls weren't shy about taking pictures, obviously thinking very little about who might be watching when they opened that little window to their life. Unfortunately, Katie was modest in comparison to some of her friends that he'd stalked by default. He found plenty of bikini shots, selfies in underwear, and suggestive images of them, but Katie was always better than that. It had only made him want her more. 
By the time he got to the last page in his favorite picture of Katie, the sun was going down, and the two boys still hadn't emerged from the house. He slipped his fingers into the sleeve and pulled out the paper. He dropped the folder on the desk and held up the paper like a doctor holding up an X-ray. The image was Katie next to one of her slutty friends, her hair down and wearing a clingy black dress that hung mid-thigh on her. She wore pearl-drop earrings and looked tanned and beautiful and much more mature than her sixteen years. Dawson's eyes took in every line, every curve, every inch of her, suddenly in disbelief that he had this gorgeous creature in his basement and awaiting his pleasure. He decided that their first tryst shouldn't be in the basement. She was worth so much more than that, and why would he hide her away when he had inherited the whole world? There was no one to stop him. No. Tonight they would share a meal and wine in his kitchen, and that dress, she just had to wear that dress. He slipped the paper back into its sleeve and put the folder away before locking the drawer again. First things first, he would need to deal with the boy and his friend now. He picked up the shotgun and headed downstairs, but then paused in the hallway, thinking for a second before turning back into the kitchen. He thought he could afford a few minutes to check on Katie. Thirteen. Katie had indeed heard Jack calling her name. It had been faint, and at first she'd wondered if it was her mind playing tricks on her. Hungry and thirsty, she had lost track of time, the blindfold effectively leaving her in permanent darkness and her mind wandering from scenario to scenario as she tried to predict what would happen next. To add insult to injury, for the last two hours she had been bursting to pee. The one constant was Jack's intermittent calling. I'm down here. No matter how much she tried to send that thought to him, his voice would fade away and seemingly give up within a few minutes. Her feelings when that happened were always mixed. Relief and disappointment. While she wanted to be rescued, she also wanted Jack out of harm's way and knew from what she had witnessed that day, Dawson wouldn't hesitate to shoot whoever got in his way, including Jack. Hours went by, and she began to will Jack to give up looking for her. If she was going to get out of this, it would be on her own. She just had to hope that Dawson would get sloppy. A short while after she had this thought, she heard the door at the top of the stairs open and close. It had been about thirty minutes since she had last heard Jack call her name. She felt a stab of adrenaline. Was this Jack come to rescue her, or Dawson coming to gloat, or worse? She strained, listening to the soft footfalls and accompanying sighs from the old wooden steps. She sensed someone next to her, and her hope that it was Jack faded. He wouldn't have just stood over her. No, it was the creep again. Tears of disappointment stung her eyes, but she refused to allow herself to cry. Let's get that blindfold off, why don't we? She felt his hands on the blindfold, and Katie gladly raised her head to assist her captor in undoing the knot. Being tied up and isolated in a basement was bad enough. Being blind only made it worse. Even though there was only dim light from a kerosene lamp on the workbench against the long wall, Katie had to blink rapidly for a few seconds as her eyes adjusted. Dawson stood over her, smiling as if he had done her a huge favor by removing her blindfold. She sneered at him and looked away in a small act of defiance. That's okay. I know you're upset. I have some water for you. Are you thirsty? She looked back at him reluctantly. He held up a clear plastic water bottle and waggled it in the air. Katie had never seen anything look so good. She nodded. Okay, I'm going to take out your gag, but if you scream or cuss me, it'll go right back in. You hear? She nodded again. Okay, good girl. A few seconds later, he pulled the horrid ball out of her mouth. Katie gasped in relief. I need to pee, she blurted as he lowered the water bottle to her lips. Oh, I've been a bad host he said with a chagrined look. 
Sorry, I was distracted by... stuff. You have a drink, and then I'll take you to the bathroom. Katie sipped the warm water as he held the mouth of the bottle to her lips. Some spilled out and over her chin, but she didn't care. She guzzled as much as she could. Wow, you're thirsty. Nearly drained the bottle. Now, I'm going to unshackle you. Same rule as the gag. If you play up, you're going straight back on and I don't care if you pee your pants, okay? She nodded. Okay? Yes. Yes what? She looked at him confused, and then it dawned on her what he wanted. Sir? That'll do for now. Whenever your gag is out, you'll call me sir. Understand? Fuck you. Yes, sir. After freeing her from the shackles, he secured her hands in front with a new set of handcuffs and led her up the stairs into the kitchen. A solitary candle sat on the counter, burning with a soft glow. Dawson pulled her towards it and picked it up before leading her down into the main hall to the bathroom. Katie glanced longingly at the front door, barely visible in the faint glow of the candle. Dawson opened the bathroom door and led her into the bathroom. He placed the candle on the sink and looked at her. I'm going to take off the handcuffs so you can do your business, but I'll be right outside the door. The window is nailed shut, and this door can't be locked from your side, so don't get any ideas. If you try anything, I'll be here in a flash, and you'll never pee or poop on your own again. Understand? Yes, sir. Good girl, he said, and took off her cuffs. Much to her disgust, he patted her backside as he walked out. Remember, I'm right outside the door. Katie swallowed her anger and revulsion at the casual molestation and watched until the door had clicked shut. She ran to the shaving cabinet. The shelves had been stripped, same for the cupboard beneath the sink. God damn it! There was nothing in the bathroom she could use as a weapon or tool to get out, not so much as a bobby pin. Feeling down but not defeated, she sat on the toilet and took care of her most pressing needs. Her captor appeared to have thought of everything, but she knew she would eventually find some crack in his armor, hopefully before he put his filthy hands on her again. Are you finished in there? He called through the door, causing her to jump. Nearly, sir. Katie finished up and went to the sink. She washed her hands and splashed cold water on her face, staring into the mirror a long time before using the clean hand towel to dry her face. I'm done, she called. The door opened instantly and he stepped in, holding up the cuffs on one finger. Hands out, please. Katie did as she was told and was soon being led out of the bathroom. They had only just re-entered the hallway when light splashed across the front of the house. Dawson's reaction was instantaneous. He blew out the candle and let it drop to the floor and gripped Katie by the upper arm, pushing her back into the bathroom before pulling the door closed. She heard a click and realized he had locked her in. A second later, she heard the unmistakable pump of a shotgun. With her heart beating a hundred miles an hour, she put her ear to the door. Fourteen. I think we should go now, said Jack. It was the third time he had said something similar. Danny looked at his Samsung phone, which was down to 20% battery life. It was 6.26 p.m., and the sun had been down for almost an hour. Okay, he agreed. Jack jumped out of his seat. Let's go. They headed out to the car, Danny carrying the backpack with a handgun inside, along with an aluminum baseball bat, its handle protruding from the top. Jack climbed behind the wheel. He didn't waste any time starting the car, but Danny put his hand on the shifter before Jack could put it in reverse. You should back out in a wide circle, so the headlights run across the front of his house, then go down and around the cul-de-sac before we head back out. He won't miss us that way. K. Okay. Jack put the headlights on high beam and reversed out of the driveway onto the road in a wide circle until the beams splashed over Dawson's house. Then he put it into drive and drove down into the end of the cul-de-sac and back out at a snail's pace. They both peered intently at the Dawson's house as they passed. The night was overcast, and with no streetlights it was hard to see details, 
but there didn't appear to be any light inside the house. Are you sure he was in there? Danny asked. It could have been wind blowing a curtain that I saw. I mean, I didn't see his face. He's in there, said Jack, his tone leaving no room for disagreement. He put his foot down, and they headed out of Loxley Close. At his front window, Dawson watched the Mazda SUV head out of his street. His heart was still beating fast as he ran to the front door, opened it, and sprinted out onto the road. In the distance, he saw the car turn right at the end. His heartbeat slowed. The kid had given up on his sister and headed out of town with a trunk full of supplies and his boyfriend riding shotgun. Good choice, asshole. Don't worry. I'll look after your sweet, sweet sister. He headed back inside and locked the front door. Hello? The sound of the voice from the bathroom was tentative and tinged with hope, and he loved it. He placed the shotgun on the console table by the door and tiptoed to the bathroom, resting his ear against it. Katie, is that you? He whispered breathlessly. The response was immediate and sudden. She pounded on the door so hard it made him jump. Jack, I'm in here. Let me out. Grinning, Dawson unlocked the door and pulled it open. Katie burst out and into his arms, only reeling back in horror when her brain registered it was her captor, rather than her brother, waiting with open arms. He didn't let her go, though, pulling her into a rough embrace as she began to kick and fight. There, there, he said. Shh. Your brother was here, but he's gone now. Packed the car and headed out with his friend. I guess it's just me and you against the world, kiddo. Katie struggled a bit longer, but the guy's arms were like knotted tree branches, and when he squeezed so hard she was unable to breathe, she capitulated, crying softly into his chest. She refused to believe that Jack had left her. But then there had been no gunshot and no sound of a fight. Why would Dawson lie? After she had calmed, Dawson slowly eased his embrace and allowed her to pull away. Gripping her by the handcuffs, he bent and retrieved the candle and led her into the kitchen. He stopped and lit it again before directing her back down into the basement. This time he didn't lay her back down on the table. Instead he grabbed the manacle that had secured her right hand to the slab and clasped it on the chain of the handcuffs she was wearing. Now that we don't have to worry about being interrupted, I'd like to invite you to dinner. Are you hungry? Katie fell against the slab. All hope washed from her. I said, are you hungry? Sniffing miserably, she nodded, even though food was the furthest thing from her mind. Good, I'll get things started. Oh, and I'll have a surprise for you, too. Like an excited kid, he bounced up the basement steps again. Relieved to be alone and frightened of what was to come, Katie looked around frantically in the flickering light thrown by the lamp. She spied a screwdriver sitting on the workbench just a few feet away. Not quite believing her luck, Katie took a few steps toward the bench, stretching out her shackled arm until the chain was taut, then reaching out with her other arm. Her hopes were soon shattered. Her outstretched fingers only just managed to brush the rough wood of the bench top at least six inches short of the tool. No, please, God, she whimpered and stretched until her wrist screamed in agony. She gained perhaps another half inch, and with every fiber of muscle, bone, and tendon burning, it was clear she wouldn't reach the screwdriver. Katie stopped trying and stumbled back to the bench. She collapsed next to it, sobbing. When he reached the kitchen, Dawson filled a saucepan of water and put it on the camp stove ready to light when he got back. He grabbed his shotgun and flashlight from the table and ran into the hallway like an excited schoolboy. A minute later, he was entering the front door of Katie's home, which had been left unlocked by her cowardly brother. He had already been in the Monahan's house that day, but knew the layout well enough from his previous visits anyway. He switched the flashlight on and took the stairs two at a time up to Katie's bedroom door. He paused a few seconds with his forehead against the door to catch his breath and allow his heartbeat to slow. What a cruel joke it would be to have a heart attack now, with her in his house and just an hour away from having his way with her. After he got his breath back, he pushed the door open and went to the chest of drawers next to her bed and pulled open the top one. 
it was what he was looking for. He rifled through her drawer, slightly disappointed that her taste in underwear was so plain. There was no lace to be seen. He grabbed a few pairs of what he considered to be the sexiest and bundled them into a plastic bag he found hanging on the door. Next, he went to the built-in wardrobe. He knew what he wanted in here, and with his flashlight tucked under his arm, he impatiently flicked through the garments, one by one, the plastic hangers clacking as he searched for the little black number. Finally, just as he was about to give up, he found it, ripping it off its hanger and stuffing it into the bag as he headed back into the hallway. On his way back to the stairs, he skidded to a halt in front of the bathroom door and quickly went through the drawers until he found one with items of makeup in it. He plucked a half-used red lipstick from the mess of items and backed it. He didn't know if it was Katie's or her mother's, but it would have to do. While his dear departed wife owned lipstick, the thought of his new paramour wearing the earthy tones his wife favored, or even allowing the same lipstick to touch her beautiful young lips, mildly revolted him. The night was still and dark as he rushed back across the road to his home. He entered and locked the door behind him. Nothing was amiss, and he rushed to the kitchen and lit the stove to begin boiling the water for the spaghetti pasta. Katie stood up when she heard the basement door open. She dreaded what the surprise would be. Was it an instrument of torture? Something sexual? She felt a bitter taste in her mouth. She thought she might just throw up if he showed her a sex toy. What she didn't expect to see was a Target shopping bag, just like the one hanging on her door. Her captor was puffing with exertion, but was clearly pleased with himself as he placed the bag on the slab and gestured that she should open it. Katie hesitated, suddenly sure it would be Jack's head or something equally horrific in the bag. Go on, open it, snapped Dawson. It won't bite you. With trembling fingers, she reached over and pulled it open keeping her face as far away as possible. Relief washed over her when she saw it was just clothes. He stood over her as she pulled the bag closer and reached in, pulling out her own dress. That's my favorite dress on you. I want you to wear it to dinner. And the lipstick. I put fresh underwear in there for you, too. I can get more stuff tomorrow, whatever you think you'll need. Katie felt sick. How on earth would he know about her dress? Exactly how long had he been stalking her? She shook her head. His smile slipped. What? he asked, genuinely puzzled at her reaction. I don't want anything to eat, she said, pushing the dress back into the bag and sliding it away from her. Like someone drawing a blind, his face went blank. He grabbed the bag and pushed it back towards Katie. Oh, we're having dinner. Not being hungry is irrelevant. You have ten minutes to get changed. Katie shook her head again, and suddenly his big hand was on her throat and squeezing it. We're having a fucking dinner date. Either you get dressed voluntarily, and we have dinner like civilized people, or I choke the life out of you right now, strip you naked, and put the fucking dress on you anyway. He squeezed harder and shook her a little. What do you say? Katie struggled to breathe as she clawed at his hand. She couldn't budge so much as a finger. Motes started to dance in her vision, and finally she weakly patted the back of his hand in submission, nodding. Dawson let go of her, and she fell against the slab, taking deep gulps of air. Good girl. I thought you'd see it my way. Now get yourself dressed. I'll be back in ten minutes. He turned on his heels and headed for the staircase. Tears welled in her eyes at the hopelessness of her situation. Her bravery didn't count for much. He knew he had her beat and didn't even bother turning around to make sure she was doing as he had told her. Ten minutes, he called from the doorway into the kitchen, before slamming the door and locking it. Katie grasped the soft material of the dress and scrunched it in her hands, her eyes staring into the distance. There really was no way out. She began to undress. Fifteen. How long should we wait? asked Annie. They had driven around the block and parked in a darkened street parallel to theirs. Not long, said Jack flatly. Danny picked up his phone. There was no reception or internet, and it was now down to a fifteen percent charge. 
Funny how the further a battery charge went down, the faster it seemed to drain. An hour? No. Twenty minutes max. We should probably wait till he's tired. It would probably even be better to wait till like one or two in the morning. Are you crazy? I don't even want to wait half an hour while Katie's alone with that bastard. Danny nodded. We go in at 7 p.m., okay? I'll take the gun. Danny wasn't sure when Jack had taken the lead in their friendship, but for now, given the circumstances, he was willing to let it be. He pulled the Glock out of his pocket and gingerly handed it to Jack. Unlike Danny, whose healthy respect for guns bordered on fear, Jack handled the pistol in a familiar fashion. While his mother hadn't allowed a gun in the home, even after he joined the shooting club, she had let his father take him to the range several times to learn to fire a pistol after he was proficient with long guns. Jack had taken to pistols like a duck to water. While he enjoyed firing rifles and shotguns, there was something different, more powerful about using a pistol. It was more of an extension of your arm than a piece of equipment. By the light of Danny's phone, he quickly ejected the magazine, then slotted it back in and chambered around. Let's get some air while we work out our plan of attack, Jack said and got out of the car carrying the gun. Standing under the tailgate of the Mazda, they selected the weapons. Danny took a small tomahawk and the baseball bat. Jack, in addition to the Glock, grabbed an eight-inch ice pick they'd found at the Connors. He pulled the sheath off to reveal a sharp aluminum needle about four inches long. Mm, don't you think you need something with a bit more stopping power? Danny snorted. Jack didn't answer, just palmed the handle and closed his fists so that the needle stuck out from the bottom. With a violent motion, he buried it to the hilt in a leg of ham they'd taken from the Connors. Danny's eyes widened. If the Glock misses and he's in close, it'll do just fine. Fair enough. Let's hope he doesn't get that close. Next, they discussed their plan of attack. Jack decided that the second story was their best bet for breaking in undetected. He would climb up the latticework on the side of the house and go in via a second-story window. To this end, he added a chisel to his small arsenal. He's bound to have made sure the ground floor windows are secure, and if he's got Katie in the basement, it's more than likely he'll be down there than not. I'll get in through a window while you wait on the ground. Once I'm in, we'll decide whether I'll let you in the front or back door or get you to come up the lattice, too. Danny didn't argue. He was beginning to get the creeps just standing in the dark in the silent street, let alone thinking about meeting a psychopath in his darkened home. When they were ready, they got back in the car and drove back to the corner of Jack Street, pulling into a driveway around the corner and four doors down. We'll go the rest of the way on foot. It was slow going in the dark. The night was overcast, the clouds dark and almost completely blotting out the moon and starlight. Neither of them had realized just how much ambient light their city generated at night until the power went out. Wish we had a flashlight, said Danny. I don't. If we accidentally splashed light on a window or he happened to be looking out, we'd be sure to get a shotgun blast for our efforts. I suppose, said Danny. He had a bad feeling about the whole exercise, but knew there was no way of talking Jack out of it. Once they were on Loxley Close, they crossed to Dawson's side of the street, sticking to the shadows of the neighboring houses until they arrived at the house next door. Danny shivered as Jack led them up the driveway and crouched behind the two trash cans next to their fence. It was only a couple of hours since they'd found the dead boy in the next-door neighbor's yard on the other side, and the horror of it was still fresh. Looks clear, Jack reported. I'll have a quick scout. You stay here. Before Danny could answer, Jack jumped the small fence that separated this yard from Dawson's and disappeared into the darkness. Danny sat back on his haunches and sighed. After three minutes, Jack hadn't returned, and he began to chew his lip. He hadn't heard a scream or a gunshot, but that didn't really ease his mind. He decided to stretch his legs and bumped his shoulder on the bigger of the two bins as he stood. It barely budged, and suddenly the face of the dead kid was floating in his mind. What if... Don't be stupid, he told himself. There's no one in the bin. The longer Jack took, the more Danny thought about the bin. In the end, he knew the only way to solve the problem was to open the damn bin and look. He took out his phone and swiped the screen. His battery was under 5% now, and the screen brightness had automatically been dimmed to preserve power. 
Holding it in his left hand, he grasped the lid and slowly lifted it as he brought the phone closer. That was when a hand fell on his arm. 16. Jesus, Jack, you scared the hell out of me. Sorry, I didn't want to risk calling out. Danny eased the lid closed. Thankfully, there was nothing in the bin but bags of trash. Well, a whisper would have been fine, he said, his voice shaky. What did you find out? He's in there, said Jack, his voice betraying a hint of outrage. I could see a sliver of the kitchen through a crack in the shutters on the side of the house. He's at the stove, and I could see two place settings on the table. I think it's for him and Katie. That's good, right? That means she's, yeah, it means she's alive. I still don't know where she is, though, and the rest of the ground floor is shut up tight. No way we could get in without making a noise loud enough for him to hear. We'll go with the original plan. You ready? Danny nodded. He had a knot in his stomach, but wasn't about to tell the kid whose sister was locked in a house with a psycho that he had a bad feeling. Okay, let's do it. They darted into Dawson's yard and headed down the side closest to them. I'll go up first, said Jack. You wait here. I'll break in, then come back to the window and tell you the plan. Danny nodded and watched his friend scurry up the latticework quickly and efficiently, his only difficulty coming when he climbed over the eaves of the overhanging roof that went around the edge of the second story. His legs dangled midair before he was able to pull himself over and disappeared. As Danny watched, Jack's head, a darker shadow against the overcast sky, appeared. Danny gave him a thumbs up by the light of his phone before Jack vanished again. A minute later, Danny heard a muffled splintering sound above him. It wasn't terribly loud, but he worried that it was loud enough to be heard inside. There was nothing after that, and Danny imagined Jack pulling up the sash window and disappearing inside. The crack of the window fastener coming free of the wooden frame seemed as loud as a gunshot for Jack. He knew it was exaggerated by the unnatural silence of the surrounds and his own expectation of stealth, but he pulled away from the window and lay flat on his stomach as he waited for Dawson to come running. He was a sitting duck and wondered if he would survive the fall if he had to slide off rather than face being shot from the window. He let three minutes pass by before concluding he hadn't been heard and inched his way back to the window and peeked inside. He had a better look inside now and could make out a large, flat shape through the curtains. A bed. Just behind the glass, he could see the window fastener hanging askew. The chisel had already lifted the window an inch, and now it was just a matter of pulling the lower sash up as quietly as he could. He held his breath and slid it up. Thankfully, it appeared to be well-maintained and slid up easily and quietly. He was pretty sure that a screech at that point would have ended his rescue mission. When he deemed it up far enough, he exhaled and placed the chisel on the window sill, then gingerly eased the leg through. The drop was further than he thought, and he almost overbalanced before his foot touched the carpeted floor and he was able to pull his other leg in. He felt his back pocket to make sure the ice pick was still in place, then pulled out the clock. He was good to go. Jack crept to the door and slowly turned the handle, taking a breath before pulling it open slowly. Again, no squeak. Thank God Larry Dawson seemed to be obsessive about the maintenance of his property. The hall he looked out upon was lit by a dim glow from the opening to the staircase that led downstairs, the candlelight he'd seen in the kitchen. Rock music he didn't recognize wafted up from the ground floor along with the smell of cooking meat. Jack's stomach growled in response. He decided to quickly investigate the upstairs, hoping the music would mask any small sounds he might make. There were only three rooms besides the one he'd come through. He found another bedroom with a single bed, a bathroom, and the final door opened on what appeared to be a study. He ducked in quietly, his heart racing at a hundred miles an hour. He was pretty sure it hadn't gone under a hundred and twenty beats a minute since he'd entered Dawson's home. It was a pretty regular study, except for the odd positioning of a telescope at the window. It was in a horizontal position facing directly across the road. Jack knew what he'd see when he looked into the scope, but looked anyway. A magnified view of his sister's darkened window filled his vision. Dirty goddamn pervert, he breathed. He didn't know he had company until he heard a floorboard creak behind him. Before he had a chance to turn or raise his gun, pain exploded in the back of his head. 
everything went black. 17. Jack, wake up, Jack! He tried to ignore the voice. His head hurt really badly, and all he wanted to do was sleep. Jack! The persistent voice wasn't going to let him. Shut up. Let me sleep. Jack, wake up, please, before he comes back. A sliver of cold, hard fear sliced through the fog in his mind, and his eyes cracked open. He was tied to a chair at the small dining table he'd seen earlier through the crack in the window, and jerked his head to the right, wincing as pain shot through his neck. Katie was sitting at the head of the table. She wore red lipstick, and her hair was pulled back from her face and tied in a bun. Her wrists were tied with red ribbons to the arms of the office chair she was sitting in, a strange accessory to the slinky black dress she wore. Thank God you're okay, she said, her voice cracking with emotion. I thought he'd killed you. Jack looked around, more gingerly this time. Where is he? I don't know. You were here when he brought me up. Shit. How long ago? I've only been here a few minutes. Jack took stock of his situation. He was in a regular kitchen chair with his hands tied behind his back. His ankles were secured to the chair legs by zip ties. Can you see what my hands are tied with? He asked, twisting his body as far forward as the restraint would allow. Katie leaned over. It's a rope, you know, like a colored one. Nylon? Yeah, about a quarter of an inch thick. It's around your wrists and tied to the middle slat of the chair back. Jack pulled against the rope. There was some give. He splayed his fingers and strained downward. His gun was gone, but maybe the bastard had missed the ice pick. The handle wasn't much thicker than a pen. What are you doing? asked Katie. I had an ice pick in my pocket, said a red-faced Jack. I'm trying to see if it's still there. Finally, the tip of his outstretched index finger brushed the rounded tip of the ice pick's handle. It was protruding from his pocket at an angle, and he realized it must have come close to falling out. He relaxed and looked at Katie. Did he say anything before he went? He said he was going to make sure we didn't have any more uninvited guests. Danny's out there. Quick, we have to get free before he finds him. Try and move your chair out and around to me. Fortunately, while Dawson had secured Katie's wrist to the handles of the office chair, he hadn't thought it necessary to do the same with her feet. With some difficulty, she was able to scoot backwards from under the table and then push her way backwards to Jack in a wide semicircle. Good. Now turn around and I'll try to stand up so you can reach my pocket with your hand. Katie spun around as Jack leaned forward and strained to straighten his legs enough to stand up. The first attempt failed miserably and he fell backwards, the chair legs scraping loudly on the tiled floor. They both froze. I'll try again. I don't know how long I'll be able to hold, so grab it as quick as you can. Jack stood again, swinging his backside in the chair towards his sister. Veins stood out in his neck as he held himself in the air, leaning back as far as he dared. Katie's outstretched fingers reached between the wide slats of the chair back. She barely brushed his pocket before Jack collapsed backwards again, the slats wrapping the back of Katie's hand on the way down. She bit back a cry of pain. Try again, she said. I nearly reached. With a supreme effort, Jack raised himself again, and Katie managed to hook her finger onto his pocket. Nearly there. Try to hold there. Bang! The unmistakable sound of a shotgun blast startled both of them into stillness. It came from the side of the house where Jack had climbed the trestle. Fuck. Hurry, Katie. 18. Danny rubbed his hands together and huddled in on himself. The clouds overhead had cleared, and while the moonlight was welcome, the night had gotten colder as they had dissipated. He was beginning to fret about Jack. It had been over five minutes, and it shouldn't have taken that long for him to come back and let Danny know the next steps of their plan. He decided to head to the front of the house and see if he could see anything through the windows of the second story. From the relative safety of a sycamore tree in the front yard, Danny looked for any sign of Jack, or anyone else for that matter. There was nothing. He gave it another two minutes before he began to seriously freak out. What if Jack had come back to the side window while he was gone? 
Danny sprinted from the cover of the tree and down the narrow space between the house and the neighbor's fence. He didn't see the dark figure, the unmistakable shape of a shotgun in its arms, until he was within two feet. His brain, honed by years of playing first-person shooter games, instantaneously made two judgments as the shotgun was brought to bear on him. One, there was no chance of stopping in time or trying to dodge the blast. Two, his only chance was to go in low and hard. He did just that. With a strange cry, part fear and part defiance, he launched himself low and hard. The gun went off as he hit his target in a perfectly executed hawk tackle, his shoulder striking his assailant in the midriff and driving him backwards, the back of his head cracking against the concrete path. Danny groaned in pain as he took stock of the situation. The ample body of Larry Dawson cushioned his fall, but the back of his foot was on fire. The blast had caught the heel of his asics while he was in mid-flight. The good news was the bastard wasn't moving. Danny scrambled off him, but had to bite down a scream at the fresh protest from his injured foot. He rested on his hands and knees for a few seconds and then reached for the shotgun. It was resting loosely in Dawson's slack hands. His hands closed over the warm barrel, and he held his breath as he pulled it delicately from the meaty hands. When it was free, he allowed himself to exhale and then used it as a crutch to climb to his feet. In severe pain but feeling empowered at having overcome the boogeyman, he hopped on his good leg and pumped the shotgun. The used cartridge fell to the ground and he aimed the weapon at Dawson. Get up! Dawson didn't move and Danny prodded the shoulder of the unconscious man with the barrel of the gun. This time the prisoner groaned. Get up, fucker! What? Danny could see Dawson's eyes glint in the moonlight. He shuffled back awkwardly. I said get up and don't try anything or I'll blow your fucking brains out. Calm down, kid, said Dawson holding his hands palm out. I'm calm enough considering you nearly blew my foot off, asshole. Sorry about that. You startled me. Yeah, right. Did Katie startle you too? Or that kid in the trash? What? What kid? And who's Katie? Just get up, yelled Danny. And keep your hands where I can see them. Okay, okay. Dawson did as he was told, keeping his hands in plain view as he got to his feet. Danny kept his distance and also kept the shotgun trained on the chest of Dawson. What now, kid? You're bleeding all over the place. Without lowering the shotgun, Danny glanced down at his foot. Dawson wasn't exaggerating. Blood was pouring from his shredded heel, which, strangely, hadn't hurt so much until the bastard pointed it out. Suddenly feeling woozy, he waggled the barrel at Dawson. I'm fine. Put your hands on your head and put your face against that wall. Dawson looked like he was going to protest, but seemed to change his mind just as quickly. He simply nodded and obeyed the order, looking dazed and a little confused. Danny moved in behind him with the vague idea of patting him down like he'd seen cops do in the movies. He took his hand off the forestock and reached out. That was when Dawson struck, swinging around with a speed that belied his size and slapping the barrel of the gun away. It went off, striking the lattice trestle that Jack had climbed so easily. Timber and leaves exploded as Danny found himself swung around and slammed headfirst into the wall. The gun fell from his hands as he tried to protect his face. The blow stunned him, but Dawson wasn't finished yet. A strong hand found his collar and gripped him, pulling him back before propelling him forward into the wall for a second time. Danny's vision exploded in swaths of color. He felt like a rag doll in the hands of a psychopathic child as he was pulled back and rammed into the wall a third time. He didn't have the means to fight. He couldn't even brace himself as he tried to reach the hands of his attacker. After the fourth blow, it didn't seem to matter. He was exhausted, and a strange liquid warmth flowed through his body as the lure of unconsciousness called him. He succumbed completely after Dawson bashed his head into the wall a fifth time. Dawson smashed the kid's head into the wall three more times, not satisfied until it looked like a cantaloupe that had been dropped from a roof. He let him drop and then gave him several kicks for good measure, angry at the kid and himself that he'd been bested and placed in such a vulnerable position. As he stood over the body, his head throbbing painfully where it had hit the pavement. Larry was glad he decided to keep Jack alive. He would make him pay for nearly ruining his date 
with the long-adored Katie. For that short period of pain, doubt, and fear, while his little boyfriend had a shotgun pointed at his heart, he would exact the ultimate revenge on Jack. He would rape his sister while he watched, and then kill him. 19. Hi, kids, said Larry Dawson happily as he came back into the kitchen, his shotgun resting in the crook of his arm. Oh, you're awake, Jack. Good. You get a front row seat to watch all the fun Katie and I are going to have before I kill you. Fuck you. Now, now, you've only got yourself to blame. You really should have kept going, you know. Dawson's tone was regretful, but his eyes ran over them in a coldly efficient manner as he placed the weapon on the breakfast bar. Katie held her breath, and Jack stared back at him defiantly. She had only just rolled the chair back to its original location seconds before their captor had returned. He apparently didn't notice anything, and after a moment, turned and headed to the cooktop. Jack saw leaves and splinters caught in Dawson's sweater. They had heard the second shotgun blast and the thudding that followed. It was clear a struggle had taken place, and it didn't bode well that Dawson was now standing in the kitchen. "'Where's Danny?' asked Jack, feeling hollow. "'Who's that now?' "'You know, asshole.' Dawson stopped stirring. "'Danny is taking a rest. A long rest where he can't disturb anyone ever again.' he said without the courtesy of turning around. Oh, no. Katie gasped and began crying. You killed him? A curtain of red descended over Jack's vision. The only thing that kept him from attempting to leap out of his chair to attack Dawson was the fact that he would end up on his face and at the mercy of the shotgun if he did. Oh, lighten up. I probably did him a favor. Katie's chin fell to her chest, and she wept quietly as Dawson began dishing up the meal he'd prepared. Jack took a deep breath as he forced his rage back in its box. While Dawson was still facing away from them, he tried to catch Katie's eye. Her tied hands curled over the end of each of the chair arms. They were clenched into fists. He knew the ice pick had to be in her left hand, but she was doing a good job of hiding it. Unfortunately, there was no way they could try to use it to free themselves unless they were left alone, and Jack had a fair idea that the chances of that were zero. When he was done serving, Dawson brought two plates to the table and sat the first on his own setting and the other in front of Katie. Sorry, Jack, none for you, he said as he leaned over Katie and began working on the ribbon, securing her right hand. Go to hell, you pathetic pervert. Jack grated, wanting to distract Dawson as he untied Katie. Dawson paused, a flash of anger crossing his face. He stood up straight and produced a flick knife from his jeans pocket. He flicked it open and held it up for Jack to see. Katie's eyes widened. If you don't shut your trap, I'll cut your tongue out and make you eat it. How do you think Sis would like that? It's okay. He's sorry. Jack, be quiet. Dawson smiled. You've been told, Jack. But that really was your last warning. He put the knife on the table, and Katie visibly relaxed. That's when Dawson pounced. He grabbed her roughly by the hair on the back of her head and pulled down sharply, locking his open mouth over hers as she grimaced in agony. Tears of rage spilled from Jack's eyes as he watched the abusive kiss. Leave her alone, you bastard! Dawson concluded the kiss and straightened. Wow, I gotta say... That kiss will make my famous bolognese taste like sawdust by comparison. Girl, you are tastier than I ever imagined. Katie was breathing hard, the pale skin around her mouth pink from the pressure of the uninvited kiss. When she spoke, her words shocked Dawson almost as much as they shocked Jack. Plenty more where that came from. But I'm really hungry and your meat sauce smells delicious. Maybe for dessert? she said seductively. Dawson's mouth hung open. Well, aren't you full of surprises, he said, finally regaining his composure. He reached out and cupped her right breast through the slick material of her dress and squeezed, waiting for a reaction. 
Katie gasped and bit her lips seductively. A look of disbelief crossed Dawson's face. He leaned over and placed his lips on hers more gently this time and kissed her. Katie kissed him back. Katie, stop it, screamed the red-faced Jack. What the fuck? Katie broke away from the kiss. It's all right, Jack. We just have to accept that this is the way it is. Dawson laughed. Holy shit. You know what? Keep being a good girl, and I might even let Jackie boy see the night out. Katie smiled. I sure hope that's what you'll do, sir. Okay, let's eat. You're going to need all your energy, he said, running a tongue over his upper lip. He reached down and finished untying the ribbon on her right hand. Thank you, sir, said Katie meekly as he moved to the other hand. Katie looked past him at Jack, her gaze more intense than her brother had ever seen it. Her ruse had worked. Unsuspecting, their captor had only just straightened when Katie reared up like a cobra and jammed the ice pick into the side of his neck. Larry Dawson screamed and clutched his neck in surprise and pain. In his hurry to pull away, he tripped on the chair leg and fell backwards, cracking his head on the corner of the table as he fell. Quick, Katie, untie me! She tore her horrified stare from the groaning Dawson and ran to Jack, beginning work immediately on the rope securing his hands behind his back. Hurry! It's not coming loose, Jack. Stop wiggling! The knife! Get his knife! screamed Jack, nodding at the still-open knife on the table. Katie ignored him, her fingers finally making some progress. There was another groan from Dawson as he kicked out, trying to get to his hands and knees. Katie yelped as the chair she'd been sitting on spun away. The knife! Katie stopped what she was doing and rushed to the table, leaning across it, almost at full stretch to avoid going anywhere near Dawson. The heeled shoe she was wearing slipped and she lost purchase just as she was about to grab the handle. Again, she lunged and smiled as her hand closed around the handle. Her smile slipped away when Dawson's meaty hand reached from under the table and gripped her wrist. 20. Katie shrieked as Dawson, his face bleached of color, lurched to his feet, the ice pick still protruding from his neck, a ribbon of blood wending its way down the collar of his sweater. The girl struggled, but even injured, Dawson's strength was too great to overcome. He held her in place as he reached up with his other hand and slowly pulled out the ice pick. The spike came free, and blood immediately pulled in the puncture and began to flow more freely from the wound. Dawson raised it and looked in disbelief at the blood-coated point of the ice pick. Then his eyes fell on Katie, forgetting for the moment that Jack was even in the same room. You fucking bitch. I'll kill you for that. Dawson shook her hand until the knife spun away across the tabletop and clattered onto the floor. Katie began to sob. Please, I'm sorry. Too late for that, missy he said, raising the ice pick as he flattened her hand on the table. No! Jack called, his shoulders moving frantically as he tried to get his hands free of the loosened rope. Dawson's lips peeled back from his teeth in an ugly smile as he drove the spike of the ice pick through the top of Katie's hand and into the hardwood tabletop, pinning her to it. Katie shrieked, but enraged beyond care, Dawson stood up and grabbed her ankles, pulling her bodily from the table, then shoving her back over it, slamming her face down next to her pinned hand. Next, he used his knee to push her thighs open and began to unzip his jeans. Jack finally got his hands free of the ropes that had been loosened by his sister, and as Dawson pulled Katie's dress up over her backside, he hurled himself, ankles still secured to the chair, in a crazy, jumping launch at the psycho, his full weight striking the big man hard in the side and carrying them both to the floor. Jack immediately began punching the face and head of their tormentor. Jack was a powerful kid. He played linebacker in his high school football team, and he also knew how to punch, courtesy of the sparring his coach made them do for fitness. The punches he landed on Dawson hurt, but the big man was doing a good job of covering up, and when Jack missed two hits, he spun like an alligator doing a death roll and trapped Jack under him. Jack flailed wildly, trying to keep his arms and wrists away from Dawson's hands, and also land punches. He knew if the big man got a grip on him, it was game over. An open-handed slap across the face was the last thing Jack expected, and it stunned him enough for Dawson to grab his left wrist and begin to reach for his right. 
That's when Katie reached over and gripped the bastard's hair, pulling on it sharply. Dawson swore and tried to extract her fingers from his hair with his free hand. Jack used the distraction to land a right hook to the chin. The blow incensed Dawson, and he released Jack's wrist and seized his throat, choking him one-handed. Jack knew he was in trouble right away. The strength of the man's grip was astounding, and with his vision swimming, he reached up and began trying to pry the thick fingers away. It was an impossible task, and Jack's eyes bulged as his face turned from red to purple. Through rapidly darkening vision, he saw Dawson finally rip the hand of his sister from his hair and batter away. His grip on Jack's throat loosened somewhat while he was busy, and Jack took a meager gulp of air before his windpipe closed again. With time running out, he gave up trying to get free of the impossibly strong hand and reached out behind his head, the fingers of his hand scrabbling like blind crabs as he searched for the knife that had fallen to the floor. The persistent Katie, still pinned to the table by her hand, appeared above Dawson again, this time screaming and scratching at his face with her free hand. Dawson's hand squeezed tighter, clearly eager to end Jack so he could deal with his sister. Jack's heartbeat became loud in his ear. His vision faded to black, and his fingers found the knife. With a last-ditch effort, he grabbed it and slashed blindly in a sweeping upwards arc. 21. It wasn't simply the sobbing, the dead weight on top of him, or the smell of smoke that brought Jack around. It was a combination of all three tugging him out of the black depths of unconsciousness. His eyes creaked open. The ceiling and walls basked in an orange glow, muted and washed by gray tendrils of smoke. Fire. He knew he should be alarmed, but the heavy weight on top of him made it hard to breathe and didn't leave room for any other concern. He took stock of his situation. His throat hurt like hell, and he was covered in a warm and sticky substance. But he was alive. And the sobbing meant Katie was, too. Katie? He croaked. His throat shrieked in protest. Jack? Oh, my God! You're alive! I thought you were... Where are you? The words were clear in his head, but came out as little more than a rasp, and each one its own little inferno of agony. Jack, you have to help me. The candle started a fire, but I can't get my hand free. Jack swallowed molten lava. Wait. He reached up, and his hand encountered the top of Dawson's head. He snatched it away quickly, but there was no movement or protest from the man. Jack started to wiggle out from under him, his fingers slipping as he tried to find purchase on the floor. He realized then why he felt wet and sticky. Copious amounts of blood coated him in the floor around him. He lifted his head the blood in his hair cooling as he examined Dawson. It would be too difficult to slide from under him. He reached out again, hands clamping the big man's head, grimacing when his finger accidentally brushed against an eyeball. He was definitely dead then. No one alive would take a finger to the eye and not flinch. Jack shivered and got on with it, twisting Dawson's head and heaving up with his own shoulder. The body shifted slightly. Hurry, Jack! With a renewed effort, he heaved again and this time managed to tip the body far enough to slip from under it. He scrambled to his feet, slipping in the blood on the floor as he rounded the upturned table. Katie leaned against it, her good hand supporting the wrist of the one that had been pinioned. She was pale, her face tired and pained. Three feet away, the candle had ignited the ugly wallpaper that covered the longest wall in the kitchen. It had fallen too far from Katie for her to reach, and the flames were now crawling up the wall and licking the ceiling. Jack knew they had only minutes to escape. He knelt next to Katie, every muscle in his body protesting the sudden move, and grasped the handle of the ice pick. It was buried deep in the table, with barely a centimeter of the thin needle showing between the skin of Katie's hand and the handle. His sister's blood was all over the handle. The puncture wound in her hand had been torn during her struggles, and he couldn't find enough purchase on the slick handle to begin to pull. Hurry, Jack! Even in the few seconds he'd taken to kneel and work on the ice pick, the flames had ignited the ceiling and were spreading rapidly overhead. Jack curled the fingers of his left hand around the handle, and then reinforced them with his right, grasping the end of the handle and spike to find better leverage. He tugged once. The whole table moved. 
He put his foot and shoulder against the vertical tabletop and pulled. Still it didn't budge. Smoke was filling the room quickly, making it difficult to breathe even down at their level. I have to move it side to side, Jack wheezed. It'll hurt. A lot. Katie nodded. Jack braced himself again and pulled, simultaneously trying to move the handle back and forth. Katie screamed in agony when he slipped and bumped against her arm. Sorry. Clenching his teeth, he gripped it again, and with a supreme effort the spike began to budge, barely a fraction of a millimeter at first, but with each back-and-forth movement it became looser. They both coughed as soft ashes began to rain on them. It was only as he readied himself to give the loosened ice pick one last tug that he realized Katie had fainted and was slumped against the table, unmoving. Coughing, he gave an almighty jerk. The ice pick slipped out, surprisingly easily in the end, causing him to fall onto his backside. Cursing, he flung the pick across the room and knelt beside Katie. He knew he was too weak to pick her up and struggling to breathe. He put his hands under her arms and stood up, dragging Katie along the floor a few feet at a time. By the light of the blaze, he made his way to the doorway to the hall, pulling Katie through just as a sheet of blackened plaster fell to the floor, throwing up a shower of sparks and dust. The air was clearer in the hallway, the smoke still clinging to the ceiling, and Jack breathed more easily as he dragged his unconscious sister to the front door. He unlocked the door and pulled it open so hard it hit the plaster and bounced back into his shoulder. Ignoring the pain, he pushed it open again with his foot and pulled Katie out onto the porch, not stopping until he dragged her into the center of the front lawn, where he collapsed beside her, sucking deep lungs full of cold, clean air.